and welcome to the awesome Archie staff training session. We believe this session is current and all the information is relevant as of the start of the academic year 2024. We want to say thank you for inviting us into your schools, into your organisations, your workplaces or even your homes. And we hope that this staff training session, which has been solely created from a lived autism experience, will help you all understand a little bit better how to support your pupils, your family members or your co-workers at zero to low cost solutions, which in this current climate, we obviously all need. So as you can see, we are Awesome Archie and we have been founded for uh, four years now and we're really proud to be able to do what we do. And in this staff training session, we're going to be covering these things with you. Who we are and what qualifies us to advise. What is neurodiversity, neurodivergency, with a brief look at autism, ADHD and school refusal. And I'm afraid it will have to be brief because obviously each one of those subjects could be a six week course in itself. But we will cover those basics and cover any uh, changed information that's more relevant to you in this academic year. How we can support the children with neurological differences with either a little budget or no additional budget whatsoever within the mainstream classroom. But of course, it can be at home as well. And the importance of transparent communication between staff and parent carers. So who am I? Why am I stood here in front of you? Why should you listen to me? Well, it's a good question. I don't exactly look like your normal uh, school educator, I grant you that. But actually, I have a real lived experience when it comes to supporting children with neurological differences. We as an organisation, as a non-profit, will never, ever judge you. We're not here to come into your organisation to start telling you that you're doing X, Y, Z wrong. That's not what we're here for. We are here to help you do your job better and so that every one of your pupils can reach their own personal best. We at Awesome Archie want every single child to be the best version of themselves and that's why we do what we do. I'm the founder of this nonprofit organization and I have four gorgeous children, two of whom have neurological differences. One of them has been diagnosed by the NHS with autism, ADHD, motor tics, potentially that's gonna be turned to Tourette's in the near future um, because he's got those vocalization tics as well. He also has a huge amount of uh, medical uh, need, um, but we also have another child who is not yet NHS diagnosed, but privately diagnosed, with ADHD, potentially autism as well. He's currently in mainstream school and Archie is in specialist provision. We also have two neurotypical children, one at college and one starting her journey down at primary school. And so we're actually very aware that we have a wealth of knowledge from all kind of areas. We also are very lucky to be one of the very few people that secured a specialist provision school for our child without the use of a legal team. Uh, we didn't go to tribunal and this is something that's incredibly rare and we're very, very proud to share with you the ways in which we did that and support other families to hopefully do the same. I personally also have multiple qualifications, uh, including I'm a, I'm a qualified SENCO. It's not, I didn't do it for the SENCO job. I did it purely for knowledge. I did it to make sure that I could support SENCOs better within mainstream schools. But I also did it so that I knew that if there were any tricks of the trade that I was missing or any SENCOs that were not perhaps achieving their own personal best, that we could help support them to do that in their role. And I've got a child psychology diploma, multiple qualifications in supporting ADHD, autism, neurological conditions. Uh, and like I say, that's been able to bring a lot of wealth and a lot of new information to the table when I'm supporting you guys in schools. It's also important that I tell you that I am an experienced one-to-one -one TA. I still do a little bit of in-school one-to-one -one supporting now as part of my job role in Awesome Archie, but I was actually blessed to support some of the most complex children within uh, mainstream for a number of years. So that helped me no end too. 
We're also proud affiliates of the Dorset Children's Foundation, Autism Unlimited, and we have the support of the brilliant Harry Redknapp. He has signed our books and raffled them off and given us messages of support. And most recently, a personalised message from Chris Packham, OBE, which for me was an absolute game changer. So thank you to those guys for their incredible support. We don't take it for granted. So let's get started. What is neurodiversity, neurodivergency? So a lot of people are talking about neurodiversity these days, um, but actually the terminology is changing because we are all in fact neurodiverse. Neurodiverse means brain difference. Well, all of our brains are different. So we're now coining the phrase neurodivergency, which means that within the neurodiverse brain, there are people who have extra challenges because their brains work even more differently to the rest of us. In this, we're going to look at autism, ADHD, and school refusal. So neurodivergent conditions, there are a number of neurodivergent conditions that we can look at here. Dyslexia, dyscalculia, Tourette syndrome or motor tics, attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder, dyspraxia, autism, of course, and an acquired neurodiversity. For, for example, if somebody has perhaps had meningitis or had an accident where their usual brain function has been changed permanently and has given them a neurodivergent outlook on life. Um, that obviously falls in this category. So using the term neurodivergent allows us to take ownership of our neurological differences without a formal diagnosis. And lots of people will question, well, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we can refer to these children, our pupils, our, our kids? as neurodivergent when they don't have a diagnosis. Well, actually, it's really important because the state of the SEN system at the moment means that so many more children who should be getting official diagnosis, who should be receiving an EHCP, who should be receiving full funding are simply not because the system as it stands is currently not working. There isn't enough funding. There isn't enough support. There isn't enough education. So we can't go in and say, you know, we have XYZ children who have got XYZ, but we need to recognise these children have a different need and we need to support them as such. We want to make sure that we are supporting the child and not their diagnosis. So we shouldn't be ever hearing a conversation in the staff room while they don't have a diagnosis. And I do hear that occasionally. And I remind people that not everyone, even into adulthood, get a diagnosis officially. In fact, I was 41 when I received my diagnosis of ADHD and I'd lived my whole life wondering what was wrong with me. And now I realise actually there's nothing wrong with me. I'm an adhd -er, you know, and it is so freeing to know. And that's what we want to instill. We want to make sure that these children are supported correctly. If you think that your child in your classroom has autism, then they probably do, because often it's quite clear cut. So even if the diagnosis isn't there, we encourage you to support that child in whichever way you can as an autistic human being. So again, just skimming the top, we can't delve into it too greatly because we'll be here for days. What is autism? This was pulled from the National Autistic Society website, and I would encourage you, if you want to take a slightly deeper dive, but not going into full uh, coursework mode, take a look at their website. They're absolutely fantastic at sharing uh, not only some of the basics that we all need to know, but some of the in-depth questions that you may have, they're probably going to answer on their site. Autism is a lifelong developmental disability, which affects how people communicate and interact with the world. More than one in 100 people on, are on the autism spectrum, and there are around 700,000 autistic adults and children in the UK. They're the ones that we know about. So actually, when you think about it, for people like me who went for 41 years as an undiagnosed adhd -er, that number is going to be increasing. Um, but even the, the diagnosed number is huge, isn't it? It shows how common it is. And here are some of the challenges. In our house, we don't like to use the word deficit. We don't like to use the word problem uh, because it feels negative. Um, and for us, there are challenging moments. And so we use challenge. So here are some of the challenges that our children on the autistic spectrum 
are going to be facing. They may have trouble with information processing, with executive function, sensory processing. They may display repetitive behaviours. They may have difficulty with their motor skills and they will most likely have trouble in their social awareness. Often there's going to be a lot of trouble within interacting with other people. That's a very common thing with children with autism. And they might, might be either extraordinarily verbal and using formal speech or they may be nonverbal altogether, um, in which case we could be using something like Sinalong or Makaton uh, or PEX to help encourage those children to communicate in their own way. They also may suffer as adults, as they grow into young adults with depression. They may have auditory processing differences. They may have sensory integration disorder, but this is hugely important. They are often hugely gifted in one or two or three areas, you know, and this is so important. We focus so much on what are called the deficits, but actually there is so much that our autistic pupil, our, our autistic student, our autistic child can offer. And if we can tap into that, then it's an amazing thing to do. They have so much to offer. And again, we've talked about Tourette's, ADHD, specific learning differences, and all of this, as you can imagine and understand, means that most of the time that child will be hugely anxious. Uh, and that really is no surprise when we look at the challenges that they face every day. So how can we support as a school, as an organization or parents at home, how can we support these gorgeous children with either a little or to no cost? Well, actually in schools, that's quite simple. And it's just a case of getting to know that individual child. Little things like knowing their triggers, little things like knowing their strengths will really, really help you. As a whole class approach, providing ear defenders. If you have them at, you know, perhaps hung on a, on a sort of handle on the side of your teaching desk or using one of those command hooks on the wall under the whiteboard, they don't need to even ask your permission to go and get them. But if they're feeling moments where it's a bit noisy, they can just simply get up, put on those ear defenders and go and sit back down. It doesn't need to interrupt the entire class. It can just be a, a standard, um, oh, we know that, let's say Archie, is gonna find this moment a little bit intense. Let's expect him to get up, put those ear defenders and sit down. That's what we will come to with our transparency of communication further on in this session. Um, but it's really, really important. And you would be amazed at how children and a whole class can actually just get so used to a child helping themselves to something if that they know that the permission is there. Often the problem only comes when other children believe that that child is doing something that is not permitted and could be seen as unfair. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. It's always really important to be proactive, not reactive. So if you know that there is going to be a fire drill for crying out loud, put the ear defenders on, just do it. Let them have them on all morning. You know, it doesn't matter. If you know that you're going to be watching a movie clip or a teaching resource online that's got some, you know, if you're doing World War II and there's sort of bombs going off and lots of noise, be proactive because it's so much easier to protect our child from going into meltdown than it is to try and get that child out of a meltdown. That requires a lot more staff support, potentially an exit from the classroom, an entire schoolroom disruption, and that will happen. But if we can stop that as many times as we can, then that's a far better way to teach. Chromebooks. For any of you who know me, you'll know that I am obsessed with Chromebooks. I have no sponsorship. I have no reason to, to <laughs> go on and on about Chromebooks other than our own lived experience of how important they are. If you have a child with a neurological difference, they are already going to be heightened. We've seen from all the things on our previous slide that they have to cope with just sitting down on the seat. If that child cannot log on quickly to Times Table Rockstar or cannot access that Word document quickly enough, then before they've even had the chance to click anything, answer a question, type anything down, they have used all of their mental resources to just get logged on. If you have the ability to have all of your children with special educational needs, particularly those who are higher up in the mainstream school who are using a lot more online learning, 
keep that one laptop for them. It doesn't mean they can go home with it. It is a school laptop. It doesn't belong to them. But perhaps put a temporary name sticker on and keep that child logged in. Every morning, log them in, have it on their desk. That means that whatever they need to do in the day is there with no fuss whatsoever. It also means that if you are having a lesson, so for example, Archie hates maths, hates maths. So what's the one lesson that he's going to misbehave, kick off, cause disruption? Maths. Of course he is. He's not going to want to do it. So actually, by differentiating the maths online for him, so allowing him, because we are, being inclusive doesn't mean making sure all of our children are doing the same. It means all of our children are achieving something. They're all learning at their own pace. If you know that this is going to be a particularly boring, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't mean boring, you know what I mean, challenging, perhaps out of reach math les lesson, have something differentiated and ready on the computer. And if that means going on for some maths online gaming, let them they're still learning. It's being inclusive rather than making that child sit through a lesson that they are simply not going to get. And at the end of it, all they're going to feel is like a failure. You know, does it matter that they're doing something different? No, because they are different. We're allowed to treat them as different because that is true inclusivity. Regular EHCP or IEP read-throughs. Now, I don't mean the standard annual with your Senko. That's not what I mean at all. Um, because again, if I was redesigning the system, I think a six monthly or a yearly EHCP review is daft. It's something that needs to be done every term because all children develop and change so quickly particularly those children who have got learning differences. Um, but obviously, we can't expect to change the entire system. So as a staff, so uh, if you've got Archie in your class, I would really love it. And I would recommend if the lead teacher could have a termly meeting with the staff that is purely discussing the progress or the lack of progress or the falling behind of every single SEND pupil. Not to have that typed up formally and do a massive EHCP review, but actually just to take some minutes, put that in your own private classroom folder so that when that EHCP meeting comes through, not only do you have a little bit of evidence of the either progression or the struggles for the whole year, and we've all done it. We only really ever refer to what's been late, latest, you know, and because that's nature, we can't remember what's happened for the whole year, particularly when we're looking after a class of 30 odd children, right? But if you have a kind of post-it note system where we're just jotting down little snippets, oh, that worked, oh, no, that didn't work. For example, we have moved Archie onto an independent desk to allow for more space and less physical contact leading to overwhelm. Currently, this is working well. Look at that the next term. Is that still working well? Great. You know that that's going to need to be put permanently in an EHCP. But if you found that that didn't work, what's the point? You know, you, you've written it down. You've put evidence that you've tried it. Always looks good for Ofsted as well. Not that I do this for that. But it shows that you're actually trying to support the individual child and you're trying, failing, trying, succeeding. Very, very important to share all of those things. Firm routine. Most of the time, as a mainstream classroom, there is going to be a firm routine. Of course, there is. We've got the maths, the English, the science. We all know it's on our curriculum map timetable. But actually, an even firmer routine for our children with special educational needs. And that can often mean breaking down that routine into mini routines. So first of all, we're going to look at, let's say, maths. Today, we're going to talk about converting fractions. I've had a little look, Archie, and I'm not sure if this whole lesson might be a little bit too much. So what we're going to do is we're going to break that down into three slightly more fun lessons. Obviously, we don't tell the whole class that, but it just means that that child is accessing things that you feel they're able to access. But actually, 
it's not making it such an enormous chunk. You've broken it down into three small steps rather than a one 20 minute mass session, which is going to be overwhelming for a lot of children, particularly those with special educational needs. Visual timetables, absolutely vital. So this is our chore board for home, um, but obviously you can make your own for other things. Simple things that they can tick off and cross if they've done it, if they've not done it. It breaks a big task into small tasks. So, for example, if we were doing a reading comprehension, it could be, have we stuck our learning intention in? Yes, we have. Tick. It just encourages the children to actually take ownership of what they're doing, but it also makes a huge task feel very, very manageable just because it's in small chunks. If your child has a PDA profile, and I'm not actually going to delve into this today, um, and that's because I'm not an expert in the PDA field, I'm going to refer you, please, to PDA Dad UK. I've been incredibly lucky over the last six months to be in fairly regular contact with this incredible guy. We met at the Test Send Show in London, and as it's termed pathological demand avoidance, which is a horrendous title, but that, that is what it is. It's a subsection kind of, uh, of autism that is even more challenging. Um, and so it takes a huge level of expertise to kind of navigate through that, particularly in a busy classroom. I'd love you uh, to please check out PDA Dad. I'll put a link in the comments below to his website to let you know he is not for children. He is for adults only. But the advice he, again, lived experience he's got to give is absolutely priceless. Um, but if you do know that you have a child with a PDA profile, if we can allow that student, that family member, whatever, to input choice, you know, if they're allowed to change the timetable for the day, so maybe they don't want to do math, English, science, does it matter? Have they got the ability to do science first? Probably a bad example because we're going to be using kit but you know what i'm saying allow them as much as you can to input their own choice and their own opinion and that is only going to greatly help clear instructions with clear expectations and consistent rewards the amount of times i go into a classroom where there are beautiful reward charts for our children with special educational needs that initially are used a lot and then they just kind of get put by the wayside well that's not going to fly. It's not going to work. That child is going to need some kind of reward. It might not be a chart. It might be a little bit of earning some extra playtime, you know, get so many marbles in the jar, have an extra break. I'm not going to teach you how to teach. That's your job. You're better at it than me. But making sure that whatever we do to reward, as long as it's working, is consistent and fair. And that includes making sure that when we have a supply teacher, when we have a, a, a college trainee, when we have a new TA, that this information is passed on immediately. We shouldn't be asking that person to read a folder at break time. If they're in the classroom with that child, they need to know and understand that child as best as they can. So a student profile, um, which one of the staff members that I assessed recently at William Gilpin School, I'm going to give you a shout out, um, Sarah, her name was, uh, I actually was lucky enough to go in and observe her. The student profile that she had printed out for her child was absolutely phenomenal. I was able to enter the room and recognize what I should expect, where our triggers were going to be, the things that perhaps I need to avoid, like initially, don't make too much contact, don't make a fuss. That student profile was just one A4 page, but it meant that I could go in and better support that child. And I think that's something that everyone should be encouraged to do if you're able to. And a communication book for home. Um, so that daily chats can be heard not on the school gate. As a mum, I remember the sheer turmoil, and I'm not exaggerating, of picking up Archie from mainstream school every single day. I'm glad to say now, I think we have moved forward a little bit. I don't think it's quite as bad as it was. But every day in front of everyone, there would be this chat of failings. And... Never once was anything sort of said about, oh, yes, this is good, this is good. It was only until Archie had his very own funded one-to-one -one that, that that negativity went away. And that's something that we can't rely on because, as we know, 
lots of these children are never receiving their full one-to-one -one, ever. Um, and even when they do, staff changes, you know, so we need to make sure that we have a way of communicating with our parent carers without public knowledge, you know, be transparent, allow for honesty, but perhaps by putting it in what we, what we would call, you know, like a little book bag kind of booklet, you know, just putting it in, writing down the positive, writing down the negative, things we might want to do for homework, things we might want to work on. And then if parent carer wants to reply, great. You know, we might have had a great day at home. We might have had a terrible day at home. But at least we all know where we stand and we're not making that child feel like a burden, which is how I used to feel. And I never want another parent to feel like that. And refer back to their area of interest. So, for example, if you know that they are keen on Lego and if they use Lego pieces um, for fun, stick them in as a mass resource. You know, these are brilliant. All, all these kinds of things. I love having all these things. We've all got Numicon, but how often have we got these fantastic resources and they're sat gathering dust in a beautifully labelled but unused drawer? Um, get them out. Get them out on the table. Have them even in a storage box under your child's desk so that it's there for them to get themselves. They don't necessarily have to wait for a TA to support them. But again, you can use Lego for so many things. If we're building a scene when we're doing creative writing, why not? actually create a scene out of Lego so that that child can immerse themselves into their writing as opposed to just using their imagination. Because for lots of children, that is really, really easy to do. But Archie could never do that, you know, and he's a published author, so it goes to show that it works. He will use uh, Minecraft usually or, or, or a Disney game to kind of immerse himself in a world. And then he can put pen to paper. So it's Again, a zero cost. We've all got bits of Lego floating around a drawer somewhere, haven't we? Use a teddy as a student uh, and allow your pupil to teach them. This is such a weird one. And this is something that I learned in one of my many courses. And I remember thinking at the time, well, that's just rubbish. Honestly, it works. So we have many, many puppets. Uh, wherever I go, we take puppets with us. And actually, if your child is verbal and able to communicate confidently with you, then allow that child to relay an answer. If you're scribing, perhaps if they talk through the puppet, they're less self-conscious. It works. The first two minutes of you doing it, you're going to feel self-conscious. And, and I'm quite an outwardly confident person. But even I thought, God, this is embarrassing. But what you can get from it, from actually just allowing a child to speak through the eyes of someone or to get them to reread what they've written to their own student or to get their student to answer the maths question. You can say, Archie, I know you don't like maths. What about Fred? Does Fred give, know the answer? And often they'll say, no, of course Fred doesn't know the answer. But they perhaps wouldn't have told you that otherwise. It's a phenomenal tool. All of these little puppets you can get from Amazon, but it doesn't even need to be a puppet. Could be a teddy from home. So that would be low cost or zero cost again. It's amazing how doing that can actually give them a sense of confidence, but also sometimes they need to feel that little bit of authority and it can give them that authority. Uniform adaptations. I know most schools are really good at this nowadays, um, but making sure that we're allowing our student with autism to have uniform adaptations. Does it really matter if they're wearing a tie? No, it doesn't matter. What matters is that they're in and that they're learning and that they're happy. Again, we'll cover that when it comes to transparency of communication. So if you have other parents or carers saying, well, my so-and-so doesn't want to wear a tie. There are different rules for different needs. And that's something that needs to be expressed more freely and unfortunately, if they don't like it, they don't like it. Uh, and things like late drop offs, early pickups, something so simple, just making sure they're not in with the crowds, out with the crowd, side door. It means they're not having to face an enormous challenge before they've even started their first lesson. 
and other tools to help support our children with autism. Now, I have said this in every school that I've visited. So in a way, I'm going to be stuffed. If I ever win the Euro Millions, I'm going to be buying all of the schools that have invited us in a Sen room like this. This is going to cost you about £30,000. It's a huge amount of money because it needs to be a beautiful kind of hub or den or wooden building but it needs to be soundproofed it needs to be insulated it needs to be lit perfectly it needs to have all of the lava lamps the leds the fiber optics um that would be the ideal but i'm a realist and i realize that not really is that going to be a thing that we can do regularly however this is we can get a really basic setup like this for a total of £70. And actually, as an organisation, we've donated many of these in schools. And when we start getting our finances coming in again more, we will, of course, donate more. Um, but a little pop-up sensory den with a plug-in LED projector is going to cost you about 70 quid, And that is something that you could have in your classroom or in a corridor or in an assembly space wherever you want to put it it is achievable so don't think because you can see how it should be and how brilliant it would be if we could all afford it that we shouldn't try go for the more basic because it works in just the same way so moving on to adhd whether it's hyperactive, uh, impulsive or inattentive. Uh, for your information, I am all of the above, depending on the mood. Most of the time I am hyperactive, which is why I work a lot. Um, but when I'm inattentive, those are the days where I'm just shut down watching movies. I literally can't remember <laughs> what I should be doing when I should be doing it. So it's a constant balance. And lots of children have a combination of all of these ADHD types. If you're an inattentive ADHD, -er, you are easily distracted. You may struggle to learn new information. For example, I can never remember names. I hate it and I'm so embarrassed by it, but I struggle. Uh, we can resist tasks that require mental energy and we regularly lose things or forget things. Thank goodness for the uh, diary on my phone. Otherwise, I wouldn't be quite so good at my job. Uh, hyperactive or impulsive ADHD, lots of squirming, lots of fidgeting, climbing the walls. Those kids who were like my Archie were going out the window. That's your hyperactive child. And they will often have difficulty taking it in turns because it's so boring waiting, isn't it? It's like, mm -mm, come on. And in the end, they just take what they want. That isn't their fault. It's a brain difference. And we need to remember that. So how can we support our ADHD pupils with low to no cost? And I've got a little picture here. So many modern offices these days, and I know this isn't a modern office, this is my kitchen. Obviously, as a non-profit, that's how I keep my costs to a minimum. I work from home. But actually, I've got a standing walking machine. And so when I'm writing my blogs, I am walking and I'm typing. Helps me concentrate. So many schools are actually using this in their classrooms. In every classroom, perhaps have one standing desk. Or if, not, if it's not an expensive standing desk, if you've got someone who's able to make a standing desk out of wood, if you've got a high filing cabinet that you could put a tablecloth over and use that as a standing desk, giving a child the ability to stand and write could literally change the way they write forever. It could be their ability to concentrate in a subject where they otherwise may struggle. Tension bands around the legs of chairs so that a child can actually kick under the chair while they're working. Wobbly cushions, rocking chairs, and please, please use fidget toys. I know that for some reason there is a thing in class that so many teachers are like, oh, I don't like to see my children fidgeting. Well, yeah, I, I know and I get it, but some people need to fidget. I'm a fidgeter. As an adult, I can't sit in a long meeting or a Zoom session or a training session without moving, without fidgeting. This entire session, I've been stepping back and forth, fiddling with my ring, doing all sorts of things to keep myself fidgeting. And so we can't expect a child who has ADHD, diagnosed or not, to be able to do the same. So again, transparency of conversation with the class, but allowing those children to have a quiet and not too intrusive fidget toy always on them so that they can just pull it out their pocket when they need to.
that's where these are great. These kind of stress weird squishy things because they make no noise at all they're easily wiped down with a with a sanitizing cloth um, make a lot of difference making sure we're using again we're referring back to these kind of things and now later next or what we're going to be doing now uh, later next etc etc making sure you could be as elaborate as you want you could make one and laminate it and make it all ooh, fancy if that's your thing but if not you can just simply use i got this from i think it was timu it was like one pound fifty an led writing tablet board thing so you could just literally write archie what we're doing you know it doesn't have to be time consuming or lots of money it just requires your interest and your effort in that pupil it also means if they've got the ability to tick it off as they're going along like we said before they're feeling like they've accomplished something that day so even if the next lesson they have a meltdown and they achieve nothing within that lesson we can refer back in our parent book to say actually we had a really tricky english session but in maths we ticked this 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 we did that so we're just able to share a lot more of, uh, of the positives as well as the challenges. So a little roundup, standing desks for allow, uh, for allow for standing working, rocking chairs or wobble cushions, tension bands, regular brain breaks. Actually, this is such an important one. If you know you've got a child who is either easily overwhelmed with, AD, uh, with autism or ADHD needs to move, allow them to have those regular brain breaks, whether that's going out in the corridor and doing 10 star jumps or perhaps playing with some Play-Doh somewhere. You know, you know your child best, but work in those regular and consistent brain breaks. They will work better for you if they know that they're going to have that ability to take a rest from that once they've achieved X, Y, or Z. Now later next, or a tick off timetable. And this is really important. ADHD is not bad behavior. And this is the only time where I ever get a little bit grumpy with teachers is when neurological differences are perceived to be either deliberate attention seeking for what purpose I don't know because all they do is get shouted at if that's the case or it's seen as perhaps a lack of discipline at home or a lack of support it is not that ADHD and autism are neurological differences and it is our duty if we want to be good educators to support each child in the best way that we can and I know it takes a huge amount of patience. And people who've worked with me will know that my patience is often tested. I'm not some person who's always happy and never telling off a child. That's not what I'm saying, but it's recognizing that ADHD is not a bad behavior. Therefore, including them in a one size fits all behavior policy will never ever work. All it will do is increase that child's anxiety, therefore increasing that parent carer's anxiety, therefore meaning that they're not able to achieve as much as they should have done. So we are talking about discipline. We are talking about reminding these children of the rules, but a one size fits all behavior policy will never ever work if you can't make adaptations for our SEND pupils. So that's something that we are also much, you will always say we do not agree with a one size fits all behavior policy. School refusal, and again, a brief overview. So I know each one of you will have a separate kind of policy or a separate leads to go to in our school refusal uh, kind of map, but it's really important that we talk about it because so many pupils with autism and ADHD or another neurological condition are frequently absent from school. And that for me is an indicator that the school's not doing something quite right. A lot of the time, uh, when we're in meetings or when we're in discussions, the school will say it's because the parent are not supporting from home. That may be true. In many cases, it may be true. I can't speak for every single parent, but my son still struggles to get into school and he is at a specialist provision with every single box ticks he is in the best school for him but even he struggles because some days are just too hard and we need to understand the importance of not blaming with school refusal take a look 
have a look at what we're doing. Does that teacher not get on with that pupil or vice versa? You know, I won't go into too much detail, but my daughter had an experience where she was absent a lot because she was desperately unhappy with her teacher. That wasn't her fault. And so we need to be looking at what we're doing to make sure that we're doing our best. We can't please everybody all the time. That's not the world we live in. But school refusal and school absences are key in making sure they're a, they're a quiet indicator of what's working well and what's not within our classroom. But obviously, of course, there can be other greater reasons, which I know you will have discussed in your safeguarding lessons. Um, but a lot of the time for our children with special educational needs, it's the school climate. It can be a low self-esteem. Perhaps they're being bullied. And you will notice there that it is by peers or teaching staff. It's an uncomfortable thing to say, but it does happen. And it shouldn't, but it does. Is there an underlying SEN need that hasn't been identified? Is there violence in school or is there simply sensory overload? Do they suffer from social anxiety, separation anxiety? Do they just feel much, much safer at home? If so, what can we do to make our classroom feel like home, make it feel safer? So again, this is the only part of this conversation that is a difficult one to hear. Um, but it is important that it's said because these children are vulnerable. They are at a kind of challenging situation that is no choice of their own because for their whole lives, they're gonna be facing discrimination and perhaps loneliness. And so it's really important that we encourage you as schools to make sure that you're doing everything you can. If that child is becoming more and more absent, we need to be changing things up. Might be a conversation with the parents, might be a conversation with the child, um, but something needs to be done, not blaming the parents, end of. And our last segment, the transparent communication between staff and parents, and this is really tricky because I know, particularly if you're, if you're in SLT, there's so much information that you're not allowed to share for legal reasons, which is great. You know, we don't all need to know everything. However, I do think and I do believe that we can be a lot more transparent with our entire classroom, um, making sure that they know why Archie is sat at a separate desk, why Archie is able to use this, but I'm not. It's being able to be transparent and say, actually, Archie has a neurological difference, which means that we have to make sure that we are allowing him to reach his own personal best. Now, this is something you can't go announcing without asking a parent's permission, because fundamentally, a parent is in charge of their child. But actually, we can't do our job effectively as educators if we don't address the difference. We can't sit with a child with ear defenders on in the corner and expect children not to ask why, because children are curious. And actually, I don't see why it's a problem to explain because there's no shame in neurodivergency. We're all different. In fact, some of the world's greatest influencers like Einstein, like the Tesla dude, what's his name? Elon Musk, you know, lots of people who've made massive changes and massive strides in science, in society have actually been people with diagnosed or not neurological differences. And so we shouldn't be attaching any shame to that. And so that's something that we really encourage. It could be that we come in for an assembly. It could be that you just have a little chat about autism. Just let the class be aware of what these conditions are and why they present challenges for children. And I've put here, open communication is about honesty, available and, uh, availability sorry, and transparency. It means that you have to tell the truth and be willing to hear it in return. And we've all had it. We've all been there, haven't we? When we've kind of either stepped over a line or, or, or said something, with, oh, perhaps we shouldn't have done that. We all make mistakes, but it's being transparent about it, learning from our mistakes and moving forward. But this also means if we're completely transparent when we're talking about our EHCP regular kind of post-it situation, it means that everyone's got access for the information that they need. And so actually less mistakes and less offensive comments or less troubling dialogue come up because actually we all know where we stand. Obviously, it means we're keeping as little to secret as possible. Again, 
not the legal stuff, not the SLT stuff that needs to be not our business, but open and honesty. If you know that this child's parents are going through a divorce, have that little chat with the TA sat with them because do you know what? That child is already struggling. So that additional challenge is not going to help their learning. It's making sure that we trust the people we work with and knowing that we can share all of the relevant information with complete transparency. It means that we can, after discussing it with parents and carers, we can explain differences within the class. It means that different children have different needs and that's okay. We're not all the same. We shouldn't all be treated the same. We all need support in certain areas, some more than others. That's okay. So as we come to the end of this seminar, and thank you for sitting through me going on and on and on, I just want to show you some references that I find useful. So the National Autistic Society website, PDA Dad UK, phenomenal. Uh, obviously, keep an eye out on the inclusion law, the Equality Act 2010, the SEND Code of Practice on gov.uk. And if you are interested and if you want to do your best for your SEND pupils, there is so much information out there. Different Kinds of Minds by Temple Grandin. In fact, all of Temple Grandin's books are fantastic. Your Child is Not Broken by Heidi Mavia is a must for every single Senko. It is the most difficult read that I have ever read because there is so much in that book that I've done myself that made me think, oh God, I can't believe it. But because I've read it and because I've seen it, I won't do those things again challenging book but absolutely important for every single senko and potentially supporting tas and teachers too again the autistic brain by temple grandin the educator's guide to pda and this one which i haven't finished yet my newest book the explosive child which sounds like a horrendous title this has been updated revised and updated it was first released in 1998 this shows how good this book is because it just keeps going. This is actually a very honest guide to supporting children with special educational needs. It doesn't, uh, <laughs> it doesn't fluff anything up. It gives it to you as it is, but it's absolutely fantastic. It's about making sure that you have an interest in these children and researching. If you don't know about autism, have a little look, research. It doesn't take you know, I've been doing this 15 years, so it's natural to me now, but it only takes 15 minutes for you to get a better picture. So we want to say thank you. Thank you so much for allowing us into your school, your organisation or your home. Please know that we are always here for you on www.awesomearchie.co.uk. On that website, you will find links to all of our socials. The socials, again, some of them are professional, some of them are more for parent carers to just try and lighten the mood. We are also on LinkedIn and on the SEND network. We want to thank you for trusting us with sharing what we know with you. And we really hope that you have found this useful. Anytime that you want to reach out to me, please do. We always try to get back to emails within 48 hours. But as you can imagine, we are inundated with people emailing us, but we will always respond to you. And I will leave you with just a little message from Arch. Thanks a lot. We hope that you found this educational video useful. We believe that every child has the right to achieve their own personal best.